this uh, as well as we do. Uh, this introduction is going to last a bit longer than, than usual, usual, but I'll try to be uh, a bit quicker uh, because there are a couple of big announcements that we have to make. So, uh, fun facts. Uh, zero speakers so far uh, used the chair during the talk. Uh, all of them were walking around and doing different hand gestures and yelling and screaming, etc. And uh, we had a tech fail, I think, on our uh, port pin on this slide, uh, remote uh, broke down or the battery went dead, but now it's working fine. Uh, we had three to four spilled beers, but interestingly, I think we didn't have uh, one uh, broken beer bottle so far, and the spillage area was around here in the second row, so watch out for your beers, guys. Uh, the longest stream so far was an hour, 34 minutes and 15 seconds. And unfortunately, we had zero female speakers yet, but uh, stay tuned for this. All this, of course, wouldn't be possible without our team of sponsors, our trustworthy beer partner, uh, Lot Split Craft, with their amazing Barba beer, uh, our dessert partner, Beaver on Cakes, and today our pizza partner as well, uh, our streaming partner, uh, Startup.hr, uh, our drive partner is a new partner, uh, this is one of those big announcements, so it's uh, Uber, you can use the Tino Meetup code and secure a 25% discount on your ride home, and they were kind enough to offer free rides for our speakers as well. Just today or uh, when it's Tino time. <laughs> <laughs> that would be too good to be true. <laughs> Uh, also, we have our speaker partner, Hamak uh, Bikro. So, big announcement number one, drum roll. Uh, Tinal workshop. So, we're going to be holding Tinal workshops from uh, this Tinal on. Uh, some facts about this. Uh, it will be a hands-on approach. So, there will be like a usual workshop with students and mentors. Uh, we will try to get as many experienced mentors and lecturers as possible uh, with various topics from the industry like we have currently here in our Tino meetups. So if you, could, you could see so far the teams were quite different with uh, different meetups. And it will be held probably three to four times per year, per year depending on, uh, on the interest of the audience. And for our first workshop we won't have one but two. Uh, workshops. Uh, the first one will be content marketing workshop and the second one will be SEO copywriting workshop. Uh, both will be held at the 9th of December uh, 2017, so this year. And uh, the first one will be at uh, 900 hours and the second one at 1400 hours. Uh, our lecturer will be Barbara Slade Jagodic. She is a freelance PR and content consultant. As far as the price range and the interest for uh, in the interesting stuff for the audience, uh, price for each workshop is 800 kunas plus PDV. If you decide to attend both lectures, then it's 1200 kunas plus PDV. Uh, first five attendees will secure a 10% discount, and of course, for students, each workshop workshop will be 400 kunas, and that means 800 kunas for both. But enough about, uh, enough about workshops and our second big announcement, drum roll too. So uh, on our next meetup, I think it will be uh, 15th of December, correct me if I'm wrong, yeah, 15th of December, uh, we'll have a special Christmas uh, team meetup with uh, two guests this time. Uh, one will be Crow Team, uh, if you're gamers, I'm sure you've heard about them, they develop serious and so it's probably the, their most famous game and also they're quite a lot into VR games and VR development in the last couple of years. I think they've developed five years in a, five games in the last, last year. And uh, the other one is Yuki. Uh, I won't tell you what the teams will be for now. That will be announced later on on our uh, social pages. Uh, so, enough about workshops, let's go to our speaker today. Uh, we talked about back-end, we talked about front-end development, we talked about design, we talked about accessibility, we talked about open source, but uh, this time we mean business and, and hardcore business. Uh, today's guest is a founder of uh, Jay Boe, uh, founded in 2003, which is an international business network. Uh, it focuses on connecting digital leaders and creating superior results. 
Uh, the company and our speaker has worked with uh, Alpha Laval, with Nordea, Red Bull, uh, United, United Nations uh, World uh, Health Organization, and he's also a frequent speaker and a productive author uh, that covers topics from internet, CMS, the strategy, and popular tools. So please uh, give a big round of applause for our next speaker. Which is This topic for today will be uh, how to execute your digital business strategy and of course please enjoy and ask all the questions you can. Uh, Thank you. You can have the stage. Uh, Thank you very much. Here's the remote. Let's see if we can get this to work. Uh, there are some empty chairs here and also in the beer spillage area here there are some empty chairs. I see many of you have a drink in the hand, that's great. Perhaps a little bit uh, unusual for this session, you will also need a smartphone or tablet. Uh, I think most of you will probably have one, but I thought about uh, how many people will come for a Thursday evening session and uh, I wasn't sure, so I'm really pleased to see so many people here, hopefully not only here for the free beer and pizza and, <laughs> and drinks, but also to uh, talk business and talk getting things done. Like you saw briefly, my focus for the last 20 years has been digital as an entrepreneur, as in a person that's built a community and held a few conferences. Uh, and I think in that process, I've failed quite a few times. It's not been a straight journey from A to B, but I've also managed to get a few things done. And I'm going to try to share some of those uh, stories. But first, let me try to set expectations. And I know always that humor translates uh, difficult. Perhaps the Danish humor um, from Denmark is not so different than Croatia, but I think uh, we all know Americans, right? And this is, this is how it's normally done in research. You know, you have a speaker, it can be junk, pretty good, good and awesome. In the US, of course, it's awesome. <laughs> and then I looked up how would this be in uh, this part of Europe, and so bear with me. This is how I've seen it. <laughs> and of course, I hope to make it to even so. Uh, I was thinking which record to break. Uh, I'm not going to try to spill a beer. I hope the technology will work. Uh, I might sit down there. I understand that Tinel means living room. And I can sit down here like in a living room. But even though I have three kids, it's still a little bit unusual to have uh, 40, 50 people just looking at you. <laughs> so I might uh, stand up again. But here's the interactive part. I can stay seated for this. So if you go on your iPad or smartphone, and if you go to slido.com and type in Tino, it's really a way to do a little bit of audience participation. So if you're out of battery or for some strange reason you didn't bring your smartphone, perhaps you can look over the shoulders of the person next to you. Should be relatively simple. Just go to slido.com and enter the code Tino. And when you go in there, uh, hopefully we can see it over here. You can see this question and you should be able to answer it. Um, if you have only 60 minutes to solve a problem and your life depended on it, how would you do it? So it's not a yes or no question, but I'll give you like a few seconds to type your answer. And if you want, you can, you can write your name at the end, but you can also be anonymous like this. And I see some of the serious answers are here quickly. Drink a beer, brute force. Uh, but think about it in the, you know, you have a digital business strategy, so let's try to at least stay, start serious. So if you have 60 minutes to solve a really important problem, <laughs> and your life depended on it, you can of course call Danilo or Alt F4. So I explain it like this different way of uh, understanding the question here. No serious answers? <laughs> That's right, higher things consulting give an answer. So I should say here, uh, I'm not a consultant, but I'm sure there are some really good consultants in Denmark. Uh, I like this one, this is probably my best uh, so far. 50 minutes to plan, 7 minutes to prepare, 3 to execute. Think of a similar working solution and copy it. Uh, so I think we're getting to something here. Of course, this is, uh, if it was really life and death, 
you would perhaps need a little bit more characters than just this, but you get the point. All right, so we'll do this uh, along the way. And uh, why don't we skip to, uh, to a little bit perhaps easier question to answer. If you have one wish, what would you like me to cover? Anything when it relates to executing a digital business strategy? If you have just one wish, and then we can have a look over here and you can uh, help me remember one thing that you really want answered. I'm sure you all came really prepared and burning questions that you really wanted to understand. Uh, yeah, stay there. <laughs> Analytic thinking rules. I don't know if the past speakers have been more like a lecture, so perhaps I'm challenging you a little bit to really participate. I think fundamentally that's a better way to learn. I think uh, in all seriousness you learn better if there's a little bit of participation. I can give you some answers, uh, perhaps I can also send you a little bit in the wrong direction. Uh, I would wish for more wishes. All right, see some people are looking at the screen, some people are looking at their own screen. So let's just get started. And this is the serious part. This is the dry part, if you like, not so funny part. Uh, when you look up getting things done and execution, I think in all honesty, we should start at least thinking that getting things done, whether you're a pilot or a doctor or a programmer, there's a lot of fundamental things about getting things done which are not so different to building a website, to uh, being an entrepreneur. And, and I, th I looked up the four disciplines of execution and I think this is really a, a good point that it's a lot of waste in the execution. It's not so hard actually to come up with the good vision or to come up with the good strategy. I don't know if any of you have read the book called Strategy and the Fat Smoker. I remember it also because it has a memorable title and really the point of strategy and the fat smoker is that it's not so hard to articulate that you would like to stop smoking and that you would like to eat more healthy but as i'm sure is conventional wisdom in croatia just like in denmark the tricky part is actually doing it it's actually stopping smoking and continuing not starting again and eating more healthy and i think that's at least just to set the stage i will talk more strategy but when we talk execution, I think that's where the real potential lies to bring you ahead of the competition. Four things here in terms of their problems, giving you the answers from the beginning. Managers and work teams don't know the goal. They don't know what to do to achieve the goal. They don't keep score and they're not held accountable. Does this sound familiar? You don't have to type it on your phone, you can just nod. Is <laughs> this total? Should I switch to Danish? <laughs> it's familiar, right? And so here are the four solutions according to uh, the four disciplines of execution. Focus on the wildly important, so having that big audacious goal, acting on the lead measures, so finding KPIs that will lead you there, keep a compelling scorecard, and create a uh, culture or cadence of accountability. So this is execution at its core. If you do this, if you do these two slides, you will most likely succeed much more than the people who are not in this room. So that's it. But I also think to be fair, there's a lot to be said that makes digital different, right? And I think when it comes to digital, we're kind of in this part of the world. And uh, you may think this is how Split looks uh, or looked 40, 50 years ago. You notice the car's a little bit older, but this photo is actually from a very early summer morning in Stockholm some 45 years ago. I don't know if any of you have seen the photo before, but that's, at that morning, a lot of people in town got up and they saw when Sweden decided to change which side of the car, they were, which side of the road they were driving. And so they changed from being like England, driving in the left side of the road to driving in the right side of the road. And I think pretty exactly that's where we are right now when it comes to digital. We've done it for many years. We've driven cars for 20, perhaps some of you even longer some of you for five, yes. but there's a change happening right now, which I think makes it very interesting to be here today and part of what I've really been looking forward to because there's a lot of things coming together right now. All right? 
And this comes actually from a big bank. And this will be one of my major themes in, in the next hour or so. It's also about taking risks, doing what may not seem like, okay, this is the safe thing to do, but we need to do it because if we don't sometimes take chances, if we don't sometimes fail, it's risky not to do it. We may not be in business in five years or even less. Uh, I brought one device today, as some of you may have seen on the meetup, and you may need to be even more quiet for this to work, but let's see. Alexa, what's the weather in Split, Croatia? Right now it's Split, Croatia. It's 45 degrees with showers and mostly cloudy skies. Tonight's forecast has cloudy skies moving in and out, with a low of 45 degrees. So, I did the very quick setup, so it was in Fahrenheit. But we can do other things too, uh, like, um, like slightly controversial things. Alexa, who shot John F. Kennedy? John F. Kennedy's shooter is Lee Harvey Oswald. So anybody wants to ask her something? Who is the real shooter? <laughs> <laughs> Alexa, are you single? <laughs> I'm totally cool with being single. Besides, it's sort of hard finding someone who's kind, funny, artificially intelligent, and doesn't mind the cloud commute. <laughs> Alexa, what's your favorite color? Infrared is super pretty. And so you can keep going like that, and uh, you can do conversions like uh, Alexa, what's uh, two, 22 Croatian kroner in Swedish kroner? Sorry, I don't know that. May have been too difficult, but uh, Alexa, what's 71 Croatian kroner in dollars? Kuna, not kroner. Sorry, I don't know that one. It's kuna, actually. Well, uh, yeah, all right, we can do that. I will do. Alexa, what's one Croatian money? That's how she started. <laughs> That's why she's single. That's why she's single, yeah. <laughs> Alexa, stop. <laughs> so the problem is when you have that in your household for too long, you start talking to that to your kids and to your wife, so that's, that's less good. I want to just give it one more shot. Alexa, what's uh, one euro in dollars? One euro equals one dollar and 18 cents. All right. But you can also do tricky things like, uh, Alexa, how many days until February 14th? There are 76 days until February 14, 2018. And my youngest daughter's birthday is that date, so I could do like this. Alexa, what's in my calendar on February 14th? On Wednesday, February 14th, there are two events. There's Anna Razzani Roy, 2016. Alexa, stop. So her name is Anna. And you can keep going like that, and you can connect it uh, to uh, Spotify. You can play music and... It's a really simple device, and the reason why I brought it here is not because it's a really risky thing to do. The reason why I brought it here is because this costs, uh, and on Black Friday, which was last week, less than thirty dollars. Forty-five million of those devices have been sold in the U.S. alone. So I realize these are not yet publicly released in Croatia, as far as I was told. But this will come like this. Perhaps it will come next week. Perhaps it will come in two weeks' time. Christmas will come, and I'm pretty sure that very soon. These will be a part of Croatian whole households, just like they are in the US and have been for half a year or a year or so. And I think the adoption, also given the low price, will be even faster than iPads. And so all of a sudden you will have this in households, and it may just be trivia and fun like we just did. But I think the future is not so far away where it also speaks Croatian, and the future is not so far away where it can do more useful things, where it can do to-do lists, where it could do a lot of things that would make sense in your work context or in your private context. Have anybody seen snowboarding New York City? Let's see, can we watch this? Do you think that might work? Do I need to click here? This is perhaps the part that could be the next text fail, tech fail. So snowboarding New York City is also about taking risks. So this was made now two winters ago where they closed basically all of New York City. And we'll see about the volume. This may not work. But basically they're saying that anybody who goes out may be arrested. Unless someone in this situation probably will arrest them if needed. If you're just a civilian out driving, you are subject to arrest. It's as simple as that. 
As you can imagine, only in New York City, they get this idea because they call this snow cabalypse. And this video got like tens of millions of shows. Wait for it. <laughs> And so the reason why I show this, we can enjoy the music a little bit. Yes. The reason why I show this is this, this was cheap. Of course, it was a little bit risky. It was filmed using drones, which are not super expensive anymore. This took less than an evening of planning. The snowcalypse came. It wasn't announced two months in advance. So it wasn't like, let's build this video on January 4th. But it happened, and they did it. And uh, for me, it's just a great example of the impact of video, which is the kind of a total detour for the conversation. But it's also showing that how cheap sometimes it is to have a massive impact. How you can strategize and strategize, and you can do vision and you can do vision. But this is on video, right? Getting that idea and then executing on it at the right time, I think it's really hard to be. And I get so happy when I watch this. Uh, I think as an adult, uh, snow doesn't really make me so happy anymore, but my kids love it. And uh, whenever you know, there's a good chance to watch this. So actually somebody joined him on skis. And then I think we wait like just 15 or so more seconds to see what happens. So let's get back to this part. So, on the serious note, back to that, we'll get back and trying to make a connection to that crazy video. The McKinsey quote, I think mandatory when you talk strategy. Those that do best, and I'm pretty sure it's the same here as in the US or in England, that digital is of course a part of what you do. I don't think I need to spend too much time on that in this audience. But then there's the here, the high tolerance for bold initiatives. It's okay to do something that we're not totally sure goes to up. I don't know how many of you work in large, complex, global organizations. That where I, that's where I tend to spend sometimes too much of my time. But that's why it's also really great to be here with uh, startups, entrepreneurs, agencies, and getting your perspective. But that support for risk-taking is important, whether you're small or whether you're large, whether you've done it for 20 years or whether you've done it for two months. Then this part is also from the US, I don't know if you've seen this before, the dead horse theory that's famous among consultants, right? The tribal wisdom of the Dakota Indian says that whenever you discover that you're riding a dead horse, the best strategy is to get off, right? And then in consultant speak, they made up all these 15 things that a consultant would do, not the Danish consultant that was recommended over here, but you can see, uh, you know, crazy ideas like buying a stronger whip, changing riders, threatening the horse with termination, and it goes on. I think it's quite funny. That's perhaps the humor part that doesn't translate so well. But uh, I think that's sometimes the mistake we do when we're trying to execute our digital business strategy. We realize too late, or we are unwilling to realize that the horse has died. And I think that's one of the most painful things when I look back at my experience doing a lot of not as crazy things as the snowball in New York City, but certainly costly things sometimes getting that realization that okay that that idea i fell in love with that and i fell a lot in love with that but the horse is dead we gotta move on and i don't know if there's ever you know a time where it's fun to fail i know the americans they really say you should embrace failure and it's great to fail i think it's it's failure is a tough teacher but you need to do it. You need to recognize sometimes that you get off that dead horse, right? Five, six years ago, responsive design was kind of the answer to everything. You know, uh, when you were building a new website or whatever, responsive design so it could stretch and work from the iPhone in the middle of the smartphone to the tablet, to the laptop, to the desktop. And certainly my answer back then was that this is not the main challenge, right? 
And then this year, just seven months ago, Google's CEO came out and said, we're moving from a mobile first to an AI first world. And that kind of made me think because mobile first was quite confusing to some. It had a tremendous impact. But I was quite curious to see, in your view, what might AI first really mean? And so I think that leads us to kind of the next question over here. Let's get to that. So what does AI first really mean? I think you all know what mobile first means, right? Think about the mobile phone first. What does AI first really mean? Does it mean like Alexa first? You can see, see. Every time you say her name, she starts. I'm not quite sure how to help you with that. There you go. So any takers on what does AI first really mean? Skynet? <laughs> Alexa, what's Skynet? That will become Skynet. Founded in 1995 and became a wholly owned subsidiary of Belticom in 1998. Might not have been that guy, but. <laughs> so, AI first means such a keyword. I was thinking that we may need moderation on this, but, but we'll just let it flow. Anybody else have? What does AI first really mean? According to Google, that's the world we're moving to, or we have arrived in, <coughs> implementing machine learning to help with everyday tasks, interfacing with all the software systems and AI-powered software. <laughs> Many people hate AI, AI it will burn. Um, I, I think one of my points was that AI is actually not something new. AI is something that's been around for a long time. If any of you have ever used Google Map, Google Maps, you've used AI, perhaps knowingly, perhaps unknowingly. AI has been around in the academia for more than 20 years. But with the advent of devices like the one I brought, Amazon Alexa, for me, it suddenly makes sense that there's a lot of these applications where why send a human to do a robot's job? There's a lot of processes and all kinds of organizations that humans don't need to do. I'm sure even as a part of your job, you're doing receipts, invoices, VAT, you're doing expenses, you're planning traveling, that's a lot of stuff. It may not be the entire process from A to B, because some of it may need a human judgment. Yes, I will take the plane or I will take the train. But I think robots could certainly, or AI could certainly do a lot. Uh, AI first, just one angle on AI first is of course also uh, voice. And I think some of you may have, have some experience with search engine optimization. And I think when we're talking about voice, SEO becomes even more important because you will get one answer. You will not get the Google screen with 10 answers and then look for yourself. You will ask one question like I just did and then you'll get one answer. And if it's not the right answer or the answer your organization wants, that's, that's a different thing. So there's a lot of lot to be said about conversational markup, how to write technical solutions that makes AI and voice easier. But, um, all right, we were there. So here's another video I'll show, just to show you how far this has come. And I think this is really important for the part of executing your digital business strategy. Let's make it a little bit larger. Uh, if you call here, I can do a little bit of voice over. So before you get across great speech recognition, it's too hard so to hear. Really well yeah. So basically, this is a Stanford professor who said that they made this experiment to find out if it's faster for a really fast typer or if it's faster by voice. And so they wanted to find out how far how far have they come? How how fast has the technology moved just in the recent years? So basically, they did this experiment with I think like a hundred words, and you'll see it briefly. Uh, they both wanted to see which one was faster, but they also wanted to see which one made the fewest mistakes. So you can see all kinds of kind of weird sentences. Uh, wear a crown with many jewels. And physics and chemistry are hard. And one was just saying it, the other one was just typing as quickly as possible. I realize there's a difference also in languages. English is quite far when it comes to voice. Danish, Croatian, some other languages are not that far yet. But essentially the conclusion here, I'll send you the slides later so you can have a, 
a closer look with uh, better with better voice. Really, what? Oh, I might I might need some help. There we go. Really, what they found out was that speech was three times faster, which to me was also quite surprising. Speech was three times faster and made half the mistakes, right? So voice has come a long way really, really quickly. And I think that has just, that's just one angle of AI that has tremendous impact. Then there's this part. I don't know if any of you have seen this before. This is actually two years old from a Sunday edition of the New York Times, uh, basically giving this quiz, did a human or a computer write this? And I'll encourage you to have a look at the quiz later. Like I said, it's two years old, but you'll be surprised at how many of the answers, how many of the sentences were written by computers. So again, I think we're not talking science fiction here. Computers have been able to write really high quality text for a number of years, and they're only getting better. And so the question is, why are we having communications people write simple text when I think communication people could do other things that added more value, perhaps like the snowboarding video or other things. For me, this is not the only point I have in terms of executing your digital business strategy. But I wanted to bring this here because I think like the Stockholm morning, that's where we are right now. This will have a massive impact on 2018. Like I said, uh, these are really cheap. And when they come into households and people start using them at home, which I'm very sure they will, it may not be the Amazon device, it may be the Google device, or it may be Siri, or whatever advice that, that Apple comes out with. They will come into work, have an expectation of why do I have to type stuff like this? When I have a situation where I need an answer, why can't I just say it out? Why can't this do smarter things? And Alexa is constantly learning. Just in the six months I've had Alexa, it's gotten substantially better in terms of doing cooking recipes. It's gotten substantially better in terms of recommending local venues. So you can say things like, uh, Alexa, where can I get pizza? To get more accurate results, go to the Alexa app and enter your address based on your zip code settings. Here are a few popular ones. Big Mario's Pizza, Serious Buying Biscuit, Wicked Alexa, Pass, stop. and the Masonry. So I did the very quick setup and it thinks I'm somewhere in Seattle. But you can connect it to Domino's Pizza and you can order your pizza. And I'm pretty sure for everybody in this room, doing it by voice like that would be faster than typing, going on the website, logging on, da 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 It's annoying. Why would you ever do that? So I think we, all of us who are building digital solutions, who are ex-tasks, who are executing some digital business strategy, need to have something like this in mind because I think this will totally disrupt some of the horses, at least, to get back to that. So here's a serious chapter that kind of gets started uh, here. And uh, this is kind of my answer to the first question. If you had 60 minutes to solve a problem, like executing your digital business strategy and your life depend on it, hopefully not, what would you do? Supposedly, I don't know if it's true or if it's just an internet kind of meme, Albert Einstein should have said, Spend 55 minutes really understanding the problem and then five minutes solving it. And I think there was one answer here saying something like 50 minutes understanding it, seven minutes devising the solution, three minutes solving it. And I think when it comes to digital, we far often jump too fast into solving it. We're, we're not really understanding the customer needs or the solution we're trying to solve. And I think that's a good place to start when you want to execute your digital business strategy. Spend a little bit more time on what is it really you're trying to achieve. Then, of course, there's a lot of key decisions to be made. What's the product you want to sell? Do you want to sell children like this famous film? Uh, do you want to, what should be the name of it? Uh, how, what the pricing is? All these key decisions. Here, my advice is make the key decisions at the latest point you can get away with. If you don't have to have a name until a certain point, wait. If you don't have to have a finite price, experiment your way to get there. Try to see if you can postpone those decisions until the last moment. Like we saw in the announcements here, okay, now I need to do the announcements, now I can do it. But you don't need to, I think, make all those decisions up front. Then, there's this Swiss really smart guy, also well known in the open source community from Typo3 and other solutions, saying speed is a new big. I very much agree with that. That you have a lot of big organizations, including Google and Amazon, which you may think are the role models. 
but they're really struggling with speed. And so I think that's an advantage for some of you in this room who are working in smaller organizations, that if you can, if you can be small or medium sized, but move quickly, I think that's what it's all about in 2017 with 2018 knocking on the door. And I think that's what it's all about when it comes to executing a digital business strategy. It's about being fast. Being fast so that you might find out that, uh-oh, we made a mistake, we failed, let's go back, let's start over, or let's change this part. But that, that element of moving fast, see if you can keep that for as long as possible. And I think here the cloud is something that I haven't mentioned, but something that we all take for granted, which kind of came in between mobile first and AI first. And of, of course, the cloud to some just means that somebody else hosts it. But I think building a digital business, executing it on top of a cloud solution also means that you don't start from zero, that you don't need to worry about all these infrastructure things that the original kind of developers 10, 20 years had to worry about. I think there's an interesting point there also on speed is that when we talk about digital business, a lot of organizations kind of started out saying that, oh, we need a website. Perhaps that was kind of 20 years ago. And they took some Microsoft Word files and put them online. And then at some point that became chaos. And there was one webmaster trying to tie it all together and build a good website or coming up with a design. I know you've talked forms and design at previous meetups. What then happened later on was that you had elements of forms and dynamic pages and perhaps there was also elements of transaction. Some vendors took it a step further like the Red Bull uh, who I know also have some creation connection uh, and it became all about managing the experience and I think what we totally lost track of in that whole journey was the content and I think that's what we set out with trying to do some content management but a lot of organizations are stuck managing websites. And I think when you're thinking about a digital business, I think you're totally on the wrong track if you're just thinking that digital business has a website. I think the world that we're in or coming in also with devices like the one whose name I won't mention because then she starts talking, <laughs> it's multi-channel, multi-devices. And the content becomes even more important. The content about organization, the content about your products, about your solutions becomes even more important because consumers, your customers, will come to expect interfaces like this. Interfaces built in to smartphones, built into apps. It can be with or without voice, but the website, I think, for an increasing amount of customers will be pretty much the last place they want to go. That will be like, oh, okay, I give up. I will have to go here. Well, when you do that, then the customer experience is already down here. But for this to really work, for us to go into this mode of not only driving in the left side of the road, but like in Sweden, in the right side of the road, we need to bring focus back on the content, on the content that's so crucial in all of our digital businesses. Then there's this, I think nobody ever said this, let's make better mistakes tomorrow. I think that's a part of life. Uh, I think alongside history, mistakes is a really bad teacher, it's really tough tough one to learn from, but you need to do it. I think I've made that point already once. Understanding what's really your product. I, uh, I saw this connection from Malachic, uh, the Red Bull owner to creation. I thought to bring this photo. Without using Slido, what do you think is really Red Bull's product? Anybody? The brand, the brand could be one. Somebody else? The Bull. The Bull? <laughs> okay, yeah, that's a guess. Uh, anybody else? Media. Media. Who said media? Where are you? There you are. Energy. Energy. The wings. Uh, in their own view, they are a media company. That's it. Their product is like a modern media company. They don't see themselves as, yes, we sell an energy drink. But with everything they're doing around sports, extreme sports, athletes, jazz, and all the other events they're doing, they see themselves much more as we're a media company. We're a new kind of way to do a media company. And the moment they realize that, because that's not what they thought the first five, 10 years. But the moment they realized that around six, seven years ago, it totally changed the way they acted. It totally changed 
the way they thought of themselves, it totally changed their appearance. They started hiring people who came from the media industry. And I think even though the energy drink might have gotten a little bit cheaper, they're still insanely successful. And they have great content. If you take a look at some of it, if you're interested in some of the extreme sports, they have amazing content. But it's really trying to understand that the product that you deliver might be the beer, the crafted beer that's so friendly sponsoring us today. The product you may be delivering may be that you, uh, you're an entrepreneur who solves some problem. But what's really your product? Trying to understand that, to me, is key for... If you don't understand that, you're going to have a really hard time executing your strategy with or without digital elements. This may be the single most important point. That's why I put it somewhere in the middle. I think this comes back to the point of what is really your product. Is your product a drill machine? Sure, there may be the business you're in that you create drill machines, but the problem that people want solved is a hole in the wall, right? That's the thing. And so speaking that language, trying to think about it differently, what is it that you really do? I think that's a good challenge to all. I'm not going to activate Slido here so that you can write funny stuff over there. See, there's already some funny stuff going on. This is, I think, he's not the inventor of marketing, but he's certainly one of the most famous marketeers for the Kotler. So look him up if you want to learn more about this. But I think this is a great quote in trying to understand what is it really about. And executing your digital business strategy is really about understanding these two slides. What's really your product? And what is it really your customers want? So the next chapter, so that was some of the key decisions. The next chapter was, I think, also uh, put over there in the first round of questions when trying to ask somebody else what have they done. And that's really why I'm here also, hopefully, trying to turn some of my experience into your advantage. That's what we do in the business that I'm a part of, that I started found in 2003. It's really peer groups where we bring together a little bit smaller groups than this, 20 people maximum. We have an annual conference, which is bigger where we try to bring peers together so they can learn from each other in working hours. And so communication people together with other communication people, marketeers, strategists, etc. And for me, trying to dig deeper into turning experience into events has really been like exploring a new world. Because you can go into any library and you can read a lot of books about networking. And I think this is networking. This is really networking as even Americans would envy this. You know, this is how it goes. And you have the beers, you have the drinks, you have the snacks. That's great. There's a lot of books written about that. There's also a lot of books written about innovation. And I think sometimes when I hear the word innovation, I almost like... Okay, where's the, where's the next beer? Because uh, there's a sense of innovation fatigue, right? We hear innovation, we have to be innovative. What does that really mean? And we can do some more meetings, we can spend a little bit more time on innovation. Come on. But there's a lot of books written about innovation. I'm not saying that's unimportant. That's just my personal feelings towards innovation. And kind of the third dimension to this is knowledge management. And that may be what some consider the most important. I think that's almost equally important. Knowledge management, a little bit like Brarian's world, it's been around for 20, 30 years. How do you manage knowledge? There's books, there's conferences given about it. This is really, for me, at the intersection of those three things. It's not only knowledge management, it's asking questions. And I think we've already seen here the power of asking questions. What does AI first really mean? Make life easier and easier up until the singularity, then we either die or live forever. And so the power of the question that brings in new insights, uh, decrease the hassle, response to context, could apply for the win. I think a question is a good place to start, right? So if I have something that I want to know more about, digital business strategy, I can try to phrase it as a question and I can ask you and say, uh, what would be the, you know, trying to make it tangible, saying, what, where should I start? And then you can come with it. Another question, because that's such a broad question, and we can have a dialogue, right? That's one way to try to turn experience into advantage. But I think, okay, that's only the start, and I think we can all, we're all human beings, so we can ask questions. But I think there's also a next step which we perhaps need to explore a little bit further, and that's the listening part. And I'm not doing a great job of this, because I'm doing all the talking, at least for the moment. I look forward to listening a lot more later. I heard there will be pizza, and 
more networking. I really want to believe that, to quote here from X-Files, that the answers are out there. Right? So when we want to turn experience into advantage, we need to both listen. So you are going to give me some advice on digital business strategy. And I think listening is a really good place to start and that may trigger new questions, more dialogue. But that, at least at its core, hasn't done anything. We've had a conversation, perhaps I learned something, perhaps I forgot it again tomorrow. But I think the real tricky part, the real where we're going to be like Christopher Columbus together is how do we take that conversation and turn it into actions? How do I take that and bring that into the office tomorrow and then implement some of that? And then perhaps have a conversation again saying, is this what you had in mind? And I think hopefully some of us, many of us are in a work environment, perhaps somewhere like this, where we can ask a colleague to come over and saying, here, look at what I've done. Is this good? Do you have some feedback, peer review? Uh, but if we want to really stop reinventing the wheel, we need to do a better job of this. And there's actually a funny story about reinventing the wheel because the wheel was actually reinvented many times. And if you go on Wikipedia, this is how it was in a new world. This is how they reinvented it. And it's actually kind of funny, but serious and sad Wikipedia page on all the iterations of when the wheel was actually invented. And we laugh at that because that's a funny anecdote. But when we're talking about digital, I'm sure there's a lot of reinvention even in this room. There's a lot of people solving the same problem every day. And why? We don't have to. If you want to have a competitive advantage, let's stop doing this. And let's try to turn it into somehow an advantage. And uh, to do this, I wanted to tell the story from this summer where I took this photo. That's my older son and a girl from school. And they went out together to watch the annual Viking festival. That's a big thing in Denmark. Uh, I think that's a part that, we, that you don't have so much down here. And people live out there for a week and it's kind of funny to go watch and, and see and they fight and they practice. And then on the last two days, they have like major fights. It's semi-staged, but, but they get serious and they dress up and they live out there in camps. And I think you all know the advantage of the Vikings. What is it that the Vikings had? What was the experience they had that gave them the advantage? Perhaps it was only for one summer, but or it was perhaps for a couple of years, and that was, of course, the longboats, right? They had the longboats. That was the experience that was turned into an advantage. They had the longboats. They could sail to England and do a little bit of friendly commerce or less friendly trade and uh, come back, and uh, then they could go to another country and do a little bit more cultural exchange, and then come back again uh, to Denmark, the longboat. So we need to think about what is our longboat, like the Red Bull can. Is that the product? What is it really, if you want to turn experience into advantage, what is it really that sets us apart? And that's where we need to focus. That's where we need to focus in terms of creating a digital business strategy. But that's very much also where we need to focus in the execution. And I think even if it was only for one summer, the Vikings did a good job of execution. Uh, now, the word could have different meanings too, but uh, Vikings had their advantage. Let's get to that point. And of course, the key point is that, uh, have any of you seen this film? Yes. I could talk and talk and talk, but 15 minutes later, everything is forgotten, right? That's like Memento. So it's a great film, a little bit of a geeky film. The person has short-term memory loss. And so I thought to introduce this right after the Vikings because you could probably be like, what the hell is going on? Uh, so let's jump to something that I think is a crucial yet overlooked part of uh, execution. Uh, and that's the business development part. And I, here there are some serious uh, slides as well, and then we can open it up for, for some more Q&A. But uh, my take on what this really is, this could be an example of business development. Uh, but... Uh, of course, no good presentation goes without saying one more thing, like Steve Jobs would have said, one more thing. It has 3,000 songs, one more thing. And so he's famous for this, stay hungry, stay foolish, and also famous for his presentation skills. But I think the key part of business development that he did to perfection, any guesses on this? I'm doing this not to annoy you, but any, any takers? What was really the thing that Steve Jobs did so well? If it was not innovation, what was the key part he did? 
Marketing. Marketing, that's one angle to it. Uh, yeah, sure. Anything he, else? Uh, he did the uh, integration of the whole experience of the customer. Integrating, yeah, like the unified experience. Yeah, sure. Anybody else? Accessibility. Second? Accessibility. Accessibility, yeah, sure. Putting it really in the palm of the hand without having to worry about MP3 files and what have you. Focusing yeah. on why. Focusing on why. I think we're getting there. I think what he was a master at, several skills, but one of the things that at least my point of view was storytelling. He was a master storyteller. And I think that's really interesting when it comes to execution and of a digital business strategy is because what's the story you're trying to tell? Does this story resonate with the person, the persons, the audience that's listening? He was a master storyteller. You could also go way back in history and you can quote people like Henry Ford saying that supposedly he said that if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse, right? And uh, whether he actually said that or not is a different thing. But Steve Jobs presented something, wrapped a story around it, and when we were finished listening to that story, we wanted it so desperately. We did not know we had that need five minutes ago or half an hour ago, but now we want it so desperately. And where I might have brought Amazon Alexa and you think, hey, that's... There you go. She lights up every time. For those of you who don't see her. Um, Is that same like marketing then? Did you call it marketing? Yeah, I think uh, storytelling is, uh, is marketing really well done. I think sometimes marketing to me has a bad rep because marketing is still today in the digital world, it's, uh, it's mesh more measurable than before. But uh, the connection from, I think the way that marketing has worked so far needs to die. We need to find a new way of marketing that I think has better stories and less of that uh, shout louder. I still think there's too much marketing, which is just let's shout louder than everybody else. And then you might hear us. And I think if, unless you're working at IKEA, who can shout really loud and then you even go to another country and there's an IKEA magazine, right? Uh, but unless you are an IKEA or similar size like a retailer, you will never be able to shout that loud. You can spend a lot of money on Facebook and you will probably mostly annoy people. But if you can tell a good story, that kind of marketing that connects with people, that story will take you places. And so the point I wanted to make, and this could have been a slide that built up slowly but truly, but I think this comes back to the to the executing of a digital business strategy that you have these quadrants, so a quite serious handwritten slide here, existing users or customers, new users or customers, existing offerings and new offerings. So if we start only with that quadrant, this would be incremental, this would be revolutionary, and this would be evolutionary, right? If I had a volunteer who could perhaps point with a collar like I think this can do, right? If I give it to you, you have to press that red. Where, where is the highest likelihood of success? There? Any other takers? Where would be the highest, the lowest risk, the highest likelihood of success? Anybody else wants to uh, guess? Uh, yeah, I can take, take that back. In my experience, the highest level of success is right here. It may also be the most boring, your existing users with the products you already have. That's, we often forget this because we're so sold on we need to be innovative, we need to come up with something new. So that may have been a part of your answer that we do something new. Right? But I think business development can also very much be, let's sell something to the customers we have that we already offer. Simple as that. Low risk, we know, hopefully, we know how to do this. That shouldn't be like a new thing. That's the new thing. We know them, so it's really just selling them more. Sorry to be the bearer of not bad news, but it's not super sexy. But most of the workshops, of the group meetings that I'm part of, they focus here. And that's not even entirely true, but because what many really do and they say, oh, I've been looking forward to this group meeting. They add like a third dimension here, existing business models and new business models. And so we start 
we spent our time talking all the way up here. New business models with a new offering to new users. What's the likelihood of success? Or in other words, yeah, what's the chances that this might fail? Relatively high. I'm not saying don't do it. This is, you know, there's a lot of energy up here. There's a lot of potential for innovation. But if you want to execute your digital business strategy and you're only focusing out here, I would also keep an active LinkedIn profile because you may need another job. <laughs> Depending, of course, where you work. So start here, then go there, then revolutionary. Uh, this, this is like groundbreaking, change the game. You're doing a totally new business model to totally new customers with a totally new offering. Why does it, I think, where at least that's a, perhaps this slide resonated so well with me because that's exactly what I felt like. We do peer groups and you're like, what the hell is a peer group? Okay, so you're here and uh, you're also here because you don't know what a peer group is. And then I say, we sell it on a subscription. Uh, so like you're out here, right? It's a tough sell. What if I told some of our members, uh, we have some more memberships for you. You can buy some more seats. And then we take that existing model and then we go down here and say, okay, now we can expand to perhaps not Croatia, at first perhaps Germany, Switzerland. When we took our product to the US and to Canada, it felt a lot like going up here. To us, it was here because it was our same offering. But for many of who did not know us, who did not know our product, who did not understand why should I meet in working hours and pay money to talk to others. There's no consultant report. There's, you know, I need to make myself responsible for translating some of our talk into a better digital strategy. That was for us a five, 10 year uphill battle of trying to really break through. So taking risks, this is me in Philadelphia, six, seven years ago when we launched our first US conference and people said, we are crazy. There's a lot of conferences in the US already. There's a lot of conferences in the US doing digital. And we said, hey, that's actually a good thing because they know conferences and we'll just do it slightly different. And it almost uh, caused us to go bankrupt twice. Uh, it did not help that at the first conference there was this thing called the Ash Cloud, which meant that many Europeans could not fly. The next year there was an outbreak of the swine flu. So we had a little bit of bad luck, uh, but we kept going. But it was tough. And of course, also internally, there was, it was tough because people asked, why are we working so hard, 51 weeks a year, earning a little bit of money and then spending it all in Philadelphia, like flying to the moon, planning our flag, doing a conference. And I said, yes, it's a part of our business strategy. It's totally different if we tell people we only have a conference in Denmark. It makes us sound less international. It's bad. We learn a lot too. We, should have, we need to have two conferences. And so that was a part of our strategy. And of course, there was a website to it, uh, one conference site there, one conference site there. So a lot of work and uh, certainly for a lot of years, not a whole lot of reward. Taking a step outside my world, but taking a step into what has happened in the last couple of years. I don't know if you're familiar with the Marketing Technology 5000. This is, I think, more well known among marketeers in the US in particular. It's still quite US centric. A very smart guy called Scott Brinker got a really good idea in 2011 to make this little bit like a world map of 150 vendors, a little bit less actually, in 2011. As you can imagine, when you start doing something like this, all of their competitors contacted Scott and said, hey, 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 I should also be on the map. So next year, 350, 1,000, 2,000, 3,500, 5,000. And so um, that's how it looks today. And when we're talking about digital strategy, I think in many organizations, the tools has this tendency of coming first. You want to come up with some strategy, but then at some point you start talking about a content management system or a portal or a marketing automation this or a newsletter system for that or a platform for this or what have you. And there's 5,000 here to pick from. So that can be a really long conversation, right? The tools and the vendors are doing it. I don't know if they're doing necessarily all a good job at marketing as you called it before, but they're certainly doing a lot of it. And it's a crowded marketplace. This to me is like the streets of Stockholm that morning some 40 years ago. It's totally crowded. I can't even, I wouldn't know what to do. 
And that's the time we live in right now. And there's no, there's no sign that in 2018 it will consolidate. This is totally without AI, predictive marketing in the direction of AI. If Scott wants to continue, he can easily make it 20,000 next year. I don't think he wants to continue because you know this is not really the kind of thing you bring to a dinner conversation. Uh, but there's also some vendors, I'm sure you've heard of some of them, like Adobe, Microsoft, Oracle, Cycle, smaller, larger, Umbraco, Pentacle, whatever they're called. Yeah, like you need like a microscope. Even if you have this in high resolution on all of your screen, and it's right in there or it's right up there. And you can build this stack like kids build these towers of bricks and then all of a sudden you have too many things on top and it falls over. And so I think this is a clear trap in terms of executing a digital business strategy that we focus too much on the technology. Certainly it's a trap if we think that the next technology that's right around the corner is what we need. There's a lot of technology out there. You can build a lot of great stuff also with this technology and this technology. Technology is not the same kind of problem as it, as it used to be. And like I said earlier, I think we need to, as organizations, focus on managing the content and less so managing the website. But I want to bring this in here because I think for me, this kind of builds the point that, uh, like that Stockholm morning. And then when I have looked at this for a couple of minutes, I really feel like watching that snowboarding New York City video one more time and saying it can be so easy. You can, if you have the right skills, two guys, you can build something amazing like that. Also to quote the Swiss guy, Elaine, speed is the new big because these guys are all big. And if you want to pick one of these, you're not going to make a lot of progress in 2018. It's going to take you a long time and you're not going to be fast. This is how it looks from a famous retailer. I made them anonymous here, but you may be able to guess who they are. It's not actually that important, but they're a retailer. They sell a consumer product. So they have their website. I wouldn't draw it like this. As you can see, they kind of made it a little bit like Napoleon, like the website is the center of the universe, it's the sun. And then you have campaigns up here, and you have a CRM system, you have performance marketing, social media, e-commerce, and multiple retailers over here. Wow, right, that's a lot of work to do. This requires a big department, so a lot of stuff to get done. But for me, again, this is like the Stockholm photo. This is what we need, even smaller businesses, even like, this event is on YouTube, this event is on Facebook, this event is on Meetup, this event used a little bit of Twitter. Of course, there's a website. And we need to be on all these different channels, or at least make a conscious decision not to. And then if we're active in Asia, there's a whole set of different channels that I know very little about. And then there's B2B versus B2C, and it goes on and on and on, and it keeps expanding, right? So, it, move beyond the mechanics, uh, if you're not making a mistake, then you're not doing anything. Realizing that that will happen, you'll have a lot of learning in 2018. Uh, think like a startup if you can, even if you're not a startup. Try to use these principles also from the Agile manifesto of being, uh, you know, working with a minimum viable product. You have extreme uncertainty. We may think that, okay, we're all good. And I think there's jobs for all of you. There's a lot to be done, but we have extreme uncertainty and we will probably have changing requirements even more so in 2018 than we have had in the last five years. Remember this as well. This is another great management quote, uh, like getting off the dead horse, what should not be done at all. And for this, I used a tennis ball challenge, which I had a little bit of conversation with the guys from Locastic, like could we throw tennis balls here? And they say, I couldn't, probably wouldn't work so well. But there's a really good challenge uh, around throwing tennis balls around in groups that's used for agile teams to really be an eye opener towards how can you really have that retrospective. So think about it, if we had a group of five people standing up here, six or seven, and I gave one person the role of being the starter, and every tennis ball had to go around to each of the seven person, but could not go around to the person next to him or her, had to be thrown or had to have some air time. And then I said, in two minutes, see how many tennis balls you could pass around. What well, normally what people do is they, they start throwing, and of course then some balls get dropped and then they need to start over. 
and it's a little bit funny and I've done it also inside large organizations like Siemens where I could tell in Munich, Germany that people were looking to the bosses and saying, what do you think we should do? How can we optimize this process? And sometimes when you do it in mixed groups like this, it's more of peers and people have some ideas. Hey, perhaps we can use both hands. Perhaps we should throw faster. And then they develop different ways where in the first iteration, the first two minutes, they do something like perhaps 10 passes around, perhaps 15. And the record that I've seen in action is more than 100. So they really optimize that process so that it's less fun. It's a lot more mechanic to do it 100 times. But for me, that's one of those exercises that has little to do with digital, but it brings it back into our working space every day that we need to stop more frequently, perhaps like we did in school, have a break. Think about what did we learn here? How does that impact the next thing we're going to do? Is it time to stop? Is it time to have a new conversation and reflect more? Perhaps I didn't really understand the advice I was given. Perhaps I should reflect and then do it in a different way. This is a part of our jobs, right? Being able to do this is what ex what's expected of us. And I think you can all learn to do things like this and even fancier tricks with fire and with swords. Uh, but I think that's often what the customers expect from us. That's what they buy, right? So let's uh, do this. Back to Slido. This is kind of where I open it up. What will be the key? This is the last poll. What will be the key to success in 2018? Any takers? I hope you're still awake. So, it's okay to type a little bit longer. And if you could type your name, then we can you know, identify yourself. We can have a conversation around this. I uh, think you did not come only to hear me. I'm sure there's a lot of smarter people here than me. But what, what's the key to success next year when we're thinking about digital business strategy? Anybody? I think that's, uh, that's certainly a key word, yeah, for sure. So now look at this tool. It can even do like a word cloud. So somebody can put in speed, or you can put in more words, and then you can kind of upvote it or level up, complex enhancements. Yeah, I think speed is a good. Anybody else? We can just do it also verbally while we're looking at the screen. Anybody? Any reflections, things you disagree with, things you were expecting? You know, you remember that grading scale? Awesome. <laughs> All right, I have more slides. <laughs> this is a not so funny slide on change because this often comes up. I thought, hey, what if you are really shy and you don't want to ask? And one of the things that often comes up is change. Change is hard, change is complicated. I don't want to stop smoking. I don't want to start eating healthy, you know, like the book, uh, Strategy and the Fat Smoker. And so on change, this is one of the best slides I've ever seen. Diagnosing reactions to change. This is actually made from a serious book uh, called the Ross Grief Cycle Model, Five Stages of Grief in Death, Dying and Bereavement. So when somebody dies, so forget about digital for a moment. When somebody dies, like your mother or whatever, you go through these five stages. And my point is that to accept what I told you, you might have to go through the same five stages. To really execute differently on your digital business strategy, you might have to go through first denial. I don't care, this guy's from Denmark, he will fly home tomorrow, forget about it. Perhaps Perhaps over dinner, I will sense a little bit of that, of that temper that I know sometimes Croatian people have. I don't accept that, it's a stupid idea. Shoot that messenger. I hope not. Then we can do the bargaining. Perhaps, all right, did you mean it in this way? Can, I, can we do it like this instead? And then there's the depression. Oh, really? Yes. I'm sorry. My life is useless. Yes, uh, I have to accept it. 
And that's the last part, you know, let's make this work together, let's win together to get the value. And my point is that in work, in all the change you go through in work, you do this consciously or unconsciously. Sometimes you may go through the first four steps in less than a minute. You have that feeling, oh, why do we have to do this? Why can't it just be the way that it's been for the last two days since you had the last change? Change is, I think, certainly one of the usual roadblocks that comes up when we're, when we're thinking about how will we be more successful next year. And I'm not any better than most people here. I resist change a lot myself. I sometimes uh, take the liberty of sending some of the other moderators to seminars, conferences, go out in the wild like this. And then more than on one occasion have they come home with a good idea, in hindsight, where I've said, that's a really bad idea. Okay, you learned that in London. Let's keep that in London. Let's do things the way we normally do it. But quite often in our group meetings, and also at the Web Summer Camp where I met Locastic, I have people saying that, oh, I've learned some great things, I'm really excited, but how will I convince management? And then they come home and management are a little bit like me, and they're like, oh, shit. We have also peer groups with managers, and I was with a group like that yesterday in the UN, in Copenhagen, in our UN city. And they said they hate when they go to seminars and they come back to their employees. And the UN is quite hierarchical and bureaucratic and slow to change. But they hate when they come back and they're the ones who are really excited. And then their staff members say, no, please, you know, it will, you know, don't do that. It's a stupid idea. And so it goes both ways. So while we might complain about managers or the managers complain about us, we all do this. And I think that's probably why that there is a model for it. I think I had one or two more slides. Yeah, here's the closing thing. There's some strategy. I think we have some good words over here now. Some of my key, key points here, accepting that failure is a part of your learning curve, taking control of risks. And uh, you could also have the conversation, is this really business strategy? Which part of it is, is the digital part? And I think I brought a few elements like the uh, Alexa. What time is it? I think there's too it's much 7:46 back. 7.46 PM. 7.46. So are we okay on time? Yeah. Uh, Alexa, <laughs> what's the news? Here's your flash briefing. In NPR news. Alexa, volume up. Alexa, Alexa, volume maximum. You can only set the volume to whole numbers between 0 and 10. Alexa, volume 10. Blah, 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 some news. Alexa, stop. And so here's a partnership. That was one of the things that I thought might have come over here, but it hasn't. I think one of the key parts to your um, digital business strategy for next year should be partnerships. Here, Amazon has partnered with NPR News, which is the national uh, public radio in the US. And there's a lot of opportunities for partnership. Ocastic has partnered with Uber. You can think of all kinds of creative partnerships. You don't need to do all of this yourself. And if you want to explore a little bit voice, AI, or anything that's remotely innovative, anything that's pretty much outside that box of it's your existing customers selling them what you're already doing, you could probably partner up with somebody and win together. And perhaps that could be one of your themes for executing your digital business strategy in the new year. So, find something you really enjoy. <laughs> I think Richard Branson is older than me, but he seems like he's having a great time dressing up as a drag for charity on one of his flights. I was not on that flight, that would have been fun. And then, I think having a, an event that has a beer sponsor, I thought this was perhaps an appropriate slide to close off with. And perhaps you cannot read it on the last rows, but it pretty much says, Planning and estimation is like alcohol. The more you look into the bottle, the more you realize that the answer isn't there.
Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you for coming. We can do a QA session, but well, that's it. So, uh, with the um, with the Mac, I think where is the Mac? Is it over here? Perhaps you can change that to the Q and A. There should be a question as well. So, if somebody is a little bit shy, you can enter your question. We can do questions as well. But let's see if we can do this as well. And then you just display questions, I think. You can get out of that. Really, uh, this is a tool called Slido, which I found works well in situations like this. I think you go out of that. I think we can do it in Q&A. Sure. All right, questions. Before everybody leaves or has more beer, there must be questions. Yes, there you go. Uh, since we've had a few CEOs from different agencies here, I was wondering, you said that uh, you keep uh, your group with like 20 people in it, and yes. you keep like consulting about all the stuff. I, like I said, I have a feeling that uh, they split these two agencies to live in their own pocket. And how did you start with it? So what, was the, what was the trajectory like in building those stuff? Because I can see the advantages in it. Yeah, I think the trick with a group is that it needs, if not 20 people, I think for a good group to really work, you need perhaps 10 people. Eight is also okay, six, five less, it becomes a little bit intense. And of course, the trick is when we start up our group in Denmark, it's like, uh, I would really like you as a member. And then the number one question is, after you've said, okay, it's a group, it's about digital, it's about strategy, and you're like, okay, yeah, that's what I work with. Perhaps I ask some questions and you talk, and most people like to talk and talk about themselves. And then the number one question was always, all right, sounds like a good idea. It's a little bit more formal than a meetup. It's, it's supposed to be the same people every time, continuity and confidentiality. Number one question was always, who else is there, right? And so the trick was always, all right, very good, hold that. And then we start talking. And then we start talking then, oh yeah, he might also come and he, oh, he'll also come, he'll also come, have like a kickoff meeting and then see who's there, who's really willing to make the commitment. And I found sometimes with agencies, we have an agency group in London and uh, we have 11 members. So there's a few available seats and I would say they really get it. They share openly, they share on proposals, they share on skills, they share on staffing issues, all kinds of things. But we also sometimes invite agencies, potential members in, and then they're like, hey, why should I sit here with my competitors? And we spend hours creating proposals for the same project. And I think it takes also a little bit of openness and transparency and saying, hey, I think there's actually value in knowing. And then you can decide for yourselves, what are you open about and what are you sharing and what are you not sharing? But I think what many agencies are struggling with, it may be the same here, is that sometimes the work is not so predictable. You may be super busy and then you would wish that the two of you were friends so that you could almost borrow a developer and a project manager. And then sometimes you may have a period where you're not so busy, but the other guy might be busy. And so I know there's a lot of that going on in between the meetings too. And so the value that we bring in is not that we don't know agency business any better than any here, or certainly not any better than the award-winning agencies in London. But we do that for a living. We bring those people together, facilitate it. Then we can have a little bit of fun on AI. We can have a serious session on data protection. And yes, they could to an extent do that themselves. That's sometimes the feedback I get. Hey, why do I have to pay to go network? I can just, I'm on LinkedIn. I can just meet people myself that I want to meet with. Sure, do that as well. But most people don't get it done. And, and I think it's one thing meeting one-on-one, -on -one, it's one thing going to a meetup, everything can be valuable. But I think the real scarce resource that all of us have is our time. And we can only use our time once. And so, of course, to justify that people go to three to four meetings, those meetings has to be really good. So, kind of a long-winded answer. Any, any others on executing? Yeah, I think I've seen you before. <laughs> Uh, I think we heard like two agendas here in this, in this presentation. Basically, <laughs> the first one would be that uh, we should plan for 55 minutes and execute for five minutes. And then later on, we heard like don't plan that much and planning an estimate is like looking so far. Uh, so, what, what is your take on that? You found the 
of contradictions. Very smart. Yes, that's right. Actually, at one point, I really made hopefully a compelling case saying plan a little bit more. <coughs> like perhaps for some of you, plan a lot more. Sorry, but there is a difference between looking at the problem and planning. Exactly. So there's the wisdom of the crowd. I think that's the key point. That uh, it's not just. I think planning also sometimes has like a bad reputation. That oh, planning, more planning, more planning, more planning. But to do the planning, I think that was the answer that was here. Perhaps you wrote that is that understanding the problem, seven minutes planning, three minutes of execution. I think yes, it's a very simplified way of looking at it. You could also say proof of concept for a given amount of minutes. And I'm a big fan of let's get out of the gate. But if you don't know where you want to go, if you don't know what's the red bull that you're selling, you're going to be really fast, but very likely in the wrong direction. Uh, and so I think that's my, you know, I, I think that's perhaps my biggest recommendation is trying to think clearer about what is it really you're trying to solve, what is really your product, and then you can run as quickly as possible to get a, to get a better product in that direction. Perhaps if you're an agency, it's on behalf of the customers, challenge them a little bit more, say, let's, do, let's not just build another app, let's not just build a better website. Yes, you may need a better app, you may need a better website, but may there be parts on that huge world map that you're really missing, or where we can quicker have a bigger impact, or where we can cheaper have a bigger impact. And so I find a lot sometimes that, uh, you know, it's also a more fun place to work uh, if you're not just building websites, if you get to do more innovative stuff, but you get to do something that dips your toes in AI and voice, whatever it might be. Right. Anybody else? If it's a really tricky question, perhaps somebody else can answer it as well. I think yes. also, um, you're, you're also, also one of the contradictions that, I, that I've heard during the, the, during the lecture. Uh, you said, I mean, you, you've been talking about how AI is, is the next big thing and you need to be quick and everything. But uh, when there was a cube on the screen where someone from the crowd was pointing it, yes. you said that we should stick uh, in the part with the, the same customers that we have and the same product that we have. But, um, isn't this the best time to take high risks and take high rewards? Uh, yeah, you could probably see that as a contra contradiction too. You could also see it that your existing offering needs an update. Perhaps you have, if you have an offering, I think that's the Google point of view. If you're offering something that has no elements of AI in it, but AI could potentially play a role, then your compet competitors will do it. They will be able to bring something to market that's cheaper, faster, better with AI. So that market share for your existing offering is going down. That will, of course, force you to do a new offering. But then you could do the new offering to the existing customers. And then after that, you can do the new offering to new customers. That's the evolutionary. I think the way I, I thought about Google's AI first statement initially was, was that, wow, mobile first was a lot of confusion. And a lot of agencies, in my view, made sometimes a little bit too easy, some money, because customers were also confused. And they may not have really needed a responsive site, but they got one. Even if all the doctors were working on a bigger screen or whatever, because it became mobile first. So we needed mobile first, even though we didn't really have perhaps mobile users. But now today, in 2017, there's a lot of mobile use cases. So that's fair enough. But there's a lot of confusion around that. It's a whole new way of thinking. Ideally, I, when I saw mobile first, I thought, Finally, are we escaping the print way of thinking? Because mobile first could, I think, build solutions that are more built for the web, for digital nature. With AI first, I'm like, where is this going? This is going to be even more confusing. The agencies are going to have a great time because customers are really going to scratch their head. They're going to need 50 weeks of planning and then 50 weeks of understanding the problem. And it's going to be a lot of that. But then, Seeing over the last six months with the advent of devices like that, but also just following Google itself, how they built AI into so many offerings, how they build it in to everything from the search bar to every programmatic marketing to ad tech. I see that it makes a lot of sense to when you're building your next thing, just think about AI. Does this, could this play a role for this offering? Yes, no. And perhaps the answer is no for that next project, but perhaps it's yes 
for the project afterwards. And I think AI is also so many different things, and I think I didn't really realize that and the extent to the depth of that until recently. Voice is only one angle. Machine learning, there's automatic meta tagging, which is not super sexy, but if you have a job or you have some customers that needs to like tag images because they have images on the website, it's not a super sexy job to have. And, and it's easy to make mistakes and did you tag it with boat and I tagged it with ship and how will we make sure and then we need a taxonomy and I think a computer could do that pretty well and there's publicly available APIs for that. It doesn't cost a fortune anymore. One last thing that also impressed me on this is IBM and IBM Watson and IBM plays a very small role in what I do. I know they exist and I know they've existed for a long time. And then I invited them into a group meeting, like a guest speaker, perhaps you should have them here at one point as well. And it was totally like a different IBM. I was impressed at how radically IBM is changing because of Watson, which is their big AI thing. Cognitive computing is what they call it. And um, I was also impressed at how far it's come. You know, it's come a long way. There's a lot of applications for this. Uh, which I thought was okay, yeah, haha, Watson can beat some machine in jeopardy, but Watson can do a lot of things. And they have a sandboxes that you can easily, if you're a little bit more technical, you can get started with this after the pizza. And you can pull in the video from this talk or from somebody else online, and you can have Watson analyze the text and say, was he positive or was he negative? In what parts of the cover of the speech was he positive or negative? And, you could, and if I was giving this a kind of a kick-off talk to members of staff, perhaps I should have been more positive. And there's a lot of stuff out there that you could not easily do without that level of computing. And, and so I think we live in really interesting times. All right, anybody else who's perhaps not working with Locastic? <laughs> All right. There's cakes, there's pizza. Thank you very much. Thank you for staying around. Uh, I think in Denmark, staying around on a Thursday afternoon uh, with the dinner coming so late. Thank you very much for coming. Appreciate it. Thank you.